And thank you very much for inviting me and also for organizing uh, this event. And it is, of course, a great pleasure here to be here and to speak to you. And I would like in particular to thank you for coming, not only because the weather is beautiful, but also uh, because you are listening to a lecture not in your own language. I have to say it's also not my own language, as you have just heard. So it is my, not my native language and um, perhaps that makes it a little bit easier for all of us uh, to understand each other. Um, I'm a sociologist by training as you've heard. I worked for a long time at the Faculty of Sociology in Bielefeld and so I feel quite at home here, though I'm now a criminologist by profession and Alexander has just told you what I'm generally doing, so I don't need to add something to this. And today's topic is state violence or state crimes and I was not aware that we would be close or in the Smolny Institute, which is of course a historical place a very important place from where the revolution actually went forward and it's also a place where presumably according to today's historians um, state violent crime took place and that was the murder of Kirov uh, which then was the starting point of a lot more of that and this will also be part of my story today a little bit so state violence and state crime so this is not about all types of state crimes this is only about one type of state crime and this is state violence so as we have defined it state crimes are or state violence is a state crime it is just a crime today, the violence that is committed by states, is just as much a crime as it is if it is committed by individuals. So a murder by state officials is, in that definition, a state crime. And it is as much prosecuted violence by the state as individual crimes are prosecuted and this is one of the major improvements that we have in contemporary justice and it is also one improvement that has come about by Europe and that has been let us say uh, forwarded by Europeans and therefore I think actually that the Europeans got the Nobel Peace Prize quite correctly which they received because Europe was seminal after World War II in trying to make violence committed by the state a real crime. It is a long road, it is not a finished road, but I think it is a very important change of how we see state crime today. So if we are going here are some definitions. Criminologists are free to define what they define as crime. And you will all know the term white collar crime. Yeah? Either in Russian language or in English. It has become a vernacular in many languages. And it means the crimes of well-to-do people, middle classes, uh, entrepreneurs and so on and so forth. But of course it's not a crime in the books. It is not in any penal code, but it covers a lot of different actions. And the same is true for state violence. State violence covers a lot of actions, a lot of different types of violence. But let us first look at what is a state crime. So here are two, um, two definitions by the then president of the American Society of Criminology. So first it is defined these are crimes that are committed by representatives of the state and then he later rectifies that a bit and says this is also behavior that violence international agreements and principles as established in international treaties and bodies and this in particular relates to all international criminal justice this relates if state for example, violate human rights principles to which they have signed up themselves. 
Most states have done that. Most states have done have uh, signed up to the conventions, for example, on civil rights and so on. Nonetheless, they violate it. Whether this is a crime or not is a big question. But anyway, these it can fall. In particular, if it is violence, it can fall under this kind of term and rubric. And so here is a which I think is one of the best definitions here. Any action that violates public international law, international criminal law and domestic law, when these actions are committed by individuals who are acting in an official capacity or by agents of the state, when they are, let us say, think they are fulfilling orders of the state, and, and this is very important. They also re result from state failure to exercise diligence, to have oversight over the actions of its agents. That is, a state is according to, let us say, the jurisdiction of recent international law, the state is responsible, for example, if they do not restrain their police forces in violence and they are responsible for doing this, they are responsible for that in international law and they are in particular responsible if they fail to prosecute it in and according to uh, in domestic courts. So failure to exercise and to prevent also crimes, for example recently in Rwanda uh, Burgemeister, a mayor in a village, has been sentenced by the International Tribunal for, for Rwanda for the genocide because he didn't prevent the genocide in his village. This is a very <coughs> tricky legal question, but you can see how the international justice is willing to make states really responsible or to make officials responsible if they do not prevent massive violence and massive crimes. So, this is bringing together who commits state crimes. So these are first individuals, then they are the leaders of the bureaucracy who are giving orders that violate laws. For example, you might have seen in the International Tribunal for Yugoslavia, you have seen heads of state. You have uh, seen in the Tribunal for Liberia, also a head of state leaders of state bureaucracies who do not prevent crimes or who turn a blind eye. And this is not only for violence, this also of course refers to corruption. Leaders in bureaucracies who do not curb and reign in corruption in their remit, in their bureaucracies, also are according to these definitions uh, accountable. And then the last thing that is also important is that there is a collective responsibility of states for violations because much of state violence is committed by, let us say, groups, collectives, goes through the hierarchies in bureaucracies. So there is a collective responsibility or for example if commanders in an army are, or a whole battalion, if they are committing war crimes, then they are made individually responsible before the courts. But there is also the notion of a collective responsibility of the state, of the so-called responsibility of giving orders or not giving orders that can prevent the crime. So you have collective responsibility which is a kind of accepted principle in international jurisprudence and you have also responsibility for inactivity, for not preventing the crime. And these are very, very important yeah, developments in international law and here is where it starts. This is the first, you will recognize this, this is the Nazi leadership on trial, that's why I said it's also about Germany. And it's at the International Military Tribunal in Nuremberg, in which Russia sat on the bench of the judges together with France and uh, the UK and the US. And here you are seeing all the de German defendants, so in the first row the person who sits like this is Göring 
and uh, they are listening to this trial. And the Nuremberg Tribunal established a collective responsibility for the leadership. They did that by actually using something that was very interesting. They used a legal um, tool that was developed against organized crime in the US. And this was uh, consp conspiracy for committing crimes. So the Nuremberg trial was the main charges against them was a conspiracy to commit war crimes and to launch an aggressive war. These were the main uh, charges against them. But this was the first time that the idea of a collective responsibility of a state leadership for the crimes committed came on trial and they were actually tried for that. And uh, most of these people who are sitting on these benches, uh, I think more than half of them actually were executed for the terrible things, for the unspeakable things and atrocities that had been committed under their orders and on their orders and uh, in their bureaucracies. So this is how it all starts. So now we are looking at what actually, what kind of actions are actually state violence. And here we take those that are most frequent and widespread today and also in countries, advanced industrialized countries. So we are speaking not about any kind of country in Africa or uh, but we are talking here about, uh, let us say, a range of countries and also European countries. This is first illegal military violence. This is mainly war crimes. Any kind of illegal violence uh, uh, that is committed in wars. And this is not only in wars between two countries, but international law today also looks into, into violence committed by armies or militias or uh, militias who are working together with the government uh, in internal conflicts, so in internal civil wars. Uh, the next is torture by police and any other state agent happening in when people are in detention. So this is all types of detention from prison to remand or so. Then it is also illegal domestic surveillance, which where the government spies onto its own citizens. It is all types of illegal police violence when police takes too much violence, which is not uh, necessary. And it is also covering up all of these. And here's now some examples, uh, which I collected across the board. So we have here illegal force by police. You can see they are cornering a person who is fairly vulnerable, has no weapon and so on. And this takes place uh, is the Italian police at the Genoa summit in 2001. Perhaps you remember the event. There was the World Summit, the G20 or uh, G20 summit in Genoa and there was a huge international movement against that one uh, or anti-capitalist movement and there you can see that against a capitalista and so there were huge clashes with the police and according to all accounts the Italian police used illegal force against these demonstrators and protesters. My other example is from Latin America. It was it is forced disappearances. That is when a state agency, the police, or any security agent or agency makes people disappear so that nobody knows where they are. And this is today, at that time it was not. Today it is a crime against humanity under international law. And these forced disappearances and these were the groups who 
made it, actually who started to make it a crime. These were the mothers of people who had disappeared in the, under the Argentina uh, dictatorship in the 1970s. They made people disappear, they captured them, many of them were actually put onto planes and then thrown out of the planes alive. They were terrible, they are at about, the estimate is that at about 30,000 people disappeared in Argentina in this way. And the demonstrations of this group helped in many ways. First, it was the start of the end of the dictatorship Second, they helped later to bring perpetrators to justice so that Argentina went through a process of transition and it also was a model and it helped to make forced disappearances and killings a crime in international law, which it is today, because it was first taken up by the so-called Inter-American Court of Human Rights and from there it migrated into international law and today in the Rome Statutes of the International Court it is one of the crimes. Here is torture. Torture, you, you think of torture of course of terrible assaults on other people. What you see here is more what is called degrading punishment, degrading behavior, so making a person look like a dog the person is also naked and this is you know these these are the photos the very famous in from Abu Ghraib prison in Iraq in Baghdad uh, and this is committed by a member of the US Army so this is torture and she has been in a court martial in the US she has been sentenced for torture and a war crime of course because this is a war crime that is committed then we have here, the next thing is political imprisonment. Thus, putting people in prison for uh, their political activism and so on. So you have here a very famous one. This is Nelson Mandela of South Africa. And he goes back to his prison cell where he spent uh, 27 years or 18 of the 27 years that he spent actually in prison. And as sometimes happens with political prisoners they become later presidents of a state so Mandela ended up as head of state here we have another case this is the civil rights leader Martin Luther King in his cell in the US in 1967 you know that he was later killed murdered and today a national holiday is named after him in the US so you can see how things can change and not only that this person is now revered but also that a society changes that a society starts governments start to think and see things in a different way so these are the types so our next question is of course why does this happen and this is what I call the paradox of state and crime because states are simultaneously two things they are the guardians of laws and rights there is nobody in the first instance who can watch over your human rights but the state in which you live this is the first place and they are in the first instance responsible also in terms of international law that you are safe and your human rights are safe but at the same time states take away human rights they are very much inclined and seduced and so this is a quote the behemoth against which rights and laws need to be defended behemoth is one of the biblical monsters the leviathan and the behemoth so this is a monster the state is at the same time a monster against whom we need to defend this and what does this actually mean how can we translate that this means that states on the one hand need to have strong institutions that guard our rights and they have to establish such institutions that means for example here a strong and independent judiciary 
who can actually look into the actions of the state and where citizens can go if they have been their rights have been violated by the state or violence has been done against them by state agents they can go there and this is an independent judiciary the state cannot do anything about this and then also what states need is to have institutions that are stronger than their state agents that can have this oversight and that can defend human rights so for example independent political parties uh, strong media who can bring things up for example if you look if I look into German uh, police misbehavior, police violence and so on, all that has been brought up by the media, by independent media and um, or corruption scandals. The first place where this comes up is the media and no other place. So we need these kind of institutions, we need and also a strong society where people feel strong enough that they can actually defend themselves or they can also defend others and they need the space to do so. So the big question is, and that was already Lenin's problem in some ways, controlling, controlling, uh, can a state police itself? Presumably not. This is difficult and can, even if we go a step down, can a police police itself? <coughs> How can we make a police to uh, not violate the law? How can we impose on the police or how can the police itself monitor their agents that they don't do this? And of course then we have international institutions and human rights regimes which are powerful enough to police states. For example, as I will show you, Latin America is the only region which reduced state violence over the past decades. And there is a very good book about this uh, by Catherine Sicking. And Catherine Sicking says, because we got a regional Latin American court for human rights, which helped people in the sta Latin American states to go against and, and help to go against uh, state violence, this has brought it down. She calls it the justice cascade. Uh, and I th I'm, I'm very hopeful, so I think she, I hope she is right. So we have another paradox that is involved here and that can be called the paradox of state strength and weakness. And both state strength and weakness um, causes higher levels of state violence. So states start to resort to illegal violence if they are too strong. If they are, have too strong militaries, too strong police, if the police is not properly restrained, uh, if the police and military forces act as powers within the state that they are not restrained as no enough, which means the state, the government is weak but the police is very strong, or security apparatus is very strong and they do what they want, rather than they do what they should do according to the laws. And also civil society actors are too weak, they have no space to defend themselves, to defend their human rights, so that means states are very strong, or at least some parts of states are very strong. But they also take up legal violent, uh, illegal violence if they are weak. For example, states that are fighting against an internal opposition, which is very strong, that is in a civil war, they resort to heavy state violence. Or if they see, for example, if, the, if a government sees itself as very weak against an internal opposition, then they take to quite high levels of state violence and the last example that you, we had perhaps was Darfur, where the state of Sudan engaged militias to fight against an internal uprising and opposition. And of course, massive state violence happened. And here again, so if they are not strong enough to control their police and military in this process. So, I want to go back a little bit 
uh, to the history of Europe between 1920 and 1945 because this can exemplify the state strength, the problem of state strength and state weakness. So what happened at that time in Europe? So after World War I, a number of democracies were set up with a lot of hope, but they mainly failed. For example, the German in Germany they failed. Uh, in Spain they failed, um, in Italy they failed. So what you have at that time, you have an increase of authoritarian states all across Europe. Poland is uh, also in this. So uh, actually one of the last functioning democracies was Czechoslovakia uh, in, uh, in this uh, era period between the wars and all others moved more or less to authoritarian states. So this comes along with a lot of state strength. Then you have they come out of internal conflicts and civil wars. Germany comes out of that. Spain has uh, a very strong civil war. Poland has part of that. And of course Russia has a very, very severe internal conflict and a prolonged civil war. And they are coming out of this and building up or rebuilding their state strength. And then these, in particular, two states start to strive for hegemony in Europe. So this is Germany and the USSR. And uh, there is a very good book about this, how this created on both sides state crimes. That is uh, Tom Snyder, Bloodlands. In particular, he looks at Central Europe in this respect. Both build up military forces and both in the process of building up their states and state strength and striving for he hegemony, they become very prone to committing state crimes and they do that. So this is why this is about Germany and it is also about your country a bit. So. Germany, of course, Nazi Germany commits one of the biggest state crimes in history. This is the Holocaust of the European Jews. And uh, this photo shows the inmates of Auschwitz at the time when they were liberated by the Red Army, which actually put a stop to what happened there. The Western Allies did not because they didn't reach the places. It was the Red Army that actually stopped this because they invaded that part. Then we have on the other hand we have political imprisonment and forced labor. Forced labor is old or huge labor camps. Here is an example from Vorkuta which was built actually in 1945. Of course there was more before but I've got this from 1945 and here is another example of which relates a little bit to the place where we are political imprisonment and violent persecution and execution so this is actually the political where the state violates um, that state violence is directed against a political enemy a political opposition and here you can see these are Bukharin and Rikov how the, when they are led to the trials that took place in Moscow in 1938. So you see we have, uh, Europe has a very very strong and of course then you have what happened in uh, Spain uh, at the time uh, of the Civil War and later. So we have, uh, Europe has a very terrible history of uh, state violence and state crime. After the war it's actually uh, transported outside of Europe, that is when the anti-colonial movement starts and the European powers fight their way out of colonial powers, uh, out of uh, Africa and so on. And again, huge numbers of state crimes committed. Recently I found that 
very interesting for people from Kenya who had been the victims of torture by the British army in Kenya during the uprising and the anti-colonial war in Kenya came to Britain to, to lay charges against the British government and the British public and British politicians were upset about this. Uh, they were of course right, they could do that according to international law because so these crimes do not have a statute of limitation, that is, they can be prosecuted all the time. And the British politicians said, what do we have to do with this? Yeah, sorry, still something you had to do with this. So, these are examples. Uh, so I'm now showing you some of my data where I compare state violence, what happens today in Europe. And we will first look at Europe globally in global context, then at different regions, and then we will look at um, institutions and, uh, let us say, factors that influence state crime, in particular from this lens of strength and weakness. So first, our first question is, of course, how do we measure this? How can we measure state violence, except for, for example, historical accounts or so? And there is a scale that is called the political terror scale. You can find that on the web. And this combines information from the US State Department, so-called country reports. They do country reports on um, and rate countries according to the political violence that they use. And they also have and Amnesty International also has reports on this. And what you can com do is you can combine these two, which I did, and they are quite highly related to each other. They are correlated. So what does this imply? This implies all the things that I showed you. So this is state sanctioned unlawful killings. This is forced disappearances. This is torture. And this is political imprisonment. So, and then a scale is designed from this, which goes from 1 to 9. 1 means no state violence and 9 means a very high level of state violence. <coughs> so, let us first see where Europe is in the world and in the three decades now from 1981 to 2010. What you can see first is that in, across the globe, state violence has increased over the past three decades. So quite considerably in what I call Anglo-North America, this is Australia, New Zealand, US, Canada, uh, also in Europe, in Asia and in Africa. And the only region which had a consistent and reduction of state violence is Latin America. They are doing quite well. Africa, we know why, because we have the terrible events in Rwanda, we have Congo and Darfur and, and the Sudan. This is, of course, goes into that. Now in Europe, we will look at why Europe gets a higher amount of state crime, in particular in the decade in the 2001 to 2010 decade. And here you can see that for the European regions. So we see North Europe goes up in, these, uh, in this time. West European democracies go considerably up from 1.3 to 1.9. Southern Europe goes up. And Eastern Europe first is the only region that goes down first quite considerably, more than 25%, then again up in the last decade. And what we can assume, so Western Europe presumably has this surge in state violence because of the uh, war against terror, which brought the UK and so on, also Spain and Southern <coughs> Europe, which increased their uh, violence uh, of the state and also um, demonstration and protests. In Eastern Europe the upsurge presumably is caused by the internal civil wars and conflicts that Russia, which is part of that region of course, had during the 
first decade of the 2000s uh, in its south, yeah, mainly in its south and south southeast. And what you can see here again is if we are comparing, and of course Europe is in a way still divided between the old established north, west, south democracies after 1945 and what is called post-communist or transitional countries and what you can see transitional countries bring the state violence down and in the west in the established democracies it goes up uh, so and this is an interesting point because that really reduced the level of state violence which with, with which they started out and let us see perhaps uh, a little bit how could that be brought about and what we can learn from that. So first I'm looking here, these are all the European countries and I'm first looking at the rule of law, that is the possibility of citizens to have an independent judicial review that they can go to the courts that the state actions are monitored by courts and by the rule of law and they uh, actually comply with the rule of law so rule of law is you can see that in the right hand corner is quite high in the nordic countries denmark sweden slovenia so it's a very good estonia so they are all on this side but also united kingdom switzerland germany less so and this is the lower 50 percent are then a number of transition countries and you see that Russia is an outlier. It has more state violence than it should have according to its rule of law credentials. That It is not very high on rule of law, but it has some credentials. And the reason for that is if you look at the time, it is the time when Russia was involved in this violent conflict, which certainly bring the level very much up and make it an outlier. If we would do it, for example, now for 2009 or 10 only, or 2011, the level would be presumably much down, uh, and perhaps at the level where Ukraine, Bolo Belarus and Moldova are. So rule of law is good, as we said, strong institutions that guard citizens are very good, and they help to bring state violence down. The next thing is what we are looking at is how the police behaves and if whether citizens have trust in the police. The question is do you trust several institutions? This is from the World Value Survey from their data and it's a mean value across this. So the percentage of people who trust the police. Again you find the Scandinavian countries in the right hand corner very they trust the police but they can do that because the police has very little violence. In contrast where you have high levels of state violence people do not trust the police. Let us take a conclusion from that. If police behaves violently then people don't have trust in it and losing trust in institutions and in the police is let us say uh, a very is not very good for governments because the police in contemporary societies is a very important institution that citizens need to um, to solve their conflicts to solve problems to protect them to feel secure so all these things that make a state or a government legitimate so our next now we are looking at transitional states and this is um, from a number of indices this is the so-called Bertelsmann transition index and they are looking and measuring how well transition countries which is here you see only the European countries but this is done for transition countries all over the world so also for Latin American or Asian or African countries they are all in this data set and they are looking at several indicators of transition and the first one is is there 
a certain level of stability of the state and government. That is, is there not a conflict? Is there not a contest about the territory of the state? Is uh, the government fairly secure in place? This doesn't mean that this is necessarily a democratic government. This is mainly about state stability. And what you can see here again is the higher right hand side, the higher state stability is, the less state violence you get. So this is one of the s things that I said. Stability and a certain level of strength reduces state violence. And you have a number of countries who did quite well there. For example, if you think of Slovenia and Croatia, who come out at that time out of a very severe conflict, but they did rather well in establishing a stable state and also in getting out of state violence, which was rampant in the uh, decade before. Now, here the rule of law is actually the same as I already showed you. If transition countries are capable of doing of establishing good rule of law institutions, independent judiciary, if they ha have their government agencies under, let us say, allow their citizens to monitor the government or in courts and so on, or have other institutions, they do rather well in bringing their state violence down. And all these things obviously brought uh, the, in the transitional countries brought the uh, state violence down considerably. Now we go more into the democracy and we have here are the democratic institutions stable? That is, do we have uh, stable elections? Do we have a parliament? Do we have transitions in government which are uh, stable and according to the democratic process? And again, you can see here that this type of stability also helps to reduce state violence. You have a number of outliers, for example, uh, Ukraine or Romania are, have quite, uh, quite good st stable democratic institutions according to this rating, but they have too high state violence because they are on uh, above the line, as you can see, which means not too bad in de terms of democratic institutions, but not doing very well with um, state violence. And here we have what is called political and social integration. That means in particular a good balance between society and the state. So citizens can have a say, but also they, the state can reign or can implement policies, programs and so on in society. So society and the state do not see themselves as enemies, but more as working together and again you can see that this also brings down state violence because we have uh, because citizens are strong enough to monitor this and also because the state is willing to take up criticism perhaps this also is political and social integration also means there is a mediation process and here the media come in or for example complaints mechanisms that mediate between political and uh, between the state the authorities and the uh, the society so that they can communicate with each other and this leads to the last factor which also has an influence that is political participation of citizens are citizens given the possibility to to participate in the process do they have a voice do they have the possibility to set up uh, their own associations free speech and so on that allow all for political participation and as you can see citizens are very important in bringing state violence down. So if I put this together what do we get? 
state violence is lower where we have a strong rule of law. It doesn't, of course, eliminate state violence, but it decreases it. Uh, where we have oversight over the government, and this is important. Then, where institutions are seen as fair and where people trust these institutions that they can go there, which also says something about the integration of society and state. That there is a certain stability of institutions and a certain balance, and that citizens can participate and can actually bring governments to account, either by using courts or by using the media or by using both, mainly using both. So first the media, the citizens and then the courts. So what, is, what are successful mechanisms that can reduce state violence? So the first mechanism that we have are or one of the, those that come to mind in particular with regard to Latin America is uh, supranational regimes. These are European courts of justices and as for example in Latin America the very influential uh, inter-American court of uh, human rights uh, who has really shaped international law. Then for example you have a committee against torture and a subcommittee to prevent torture and according to an optional protocol I couldn't find out whether Russia has signed it or not uh, the committee can go to prisons and police stations without notice surprise visits yep I mean I asked my colleagues how that worked and of course it works in Sweden and it works in the Netherlands and they not, don't think that they always find good things. Mm. No, 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 no. But of course, it seems to work less good in other states. But one has to see how that works. This is a very new development in 2008. The other thing that I think is very important is civil society engagement. And now we have, I didn't mention that, but it is a very important feature of state violence that it normally does not target the whole population. Only in what you would call a totalitarian state, the whole population lives in fear. This is normally not the case. Normally only certain groups are selected and singled out. And for example in Nazi Germany of course the Jews were prosecuted and singled out. The Germans, the Germans themselves were not very much prosecuted. It only started, uh, let us say, when the war went wrong. Pre after Stalingrad, prosecution of Germans for political reasons goes up. Before that, they are nearly, they are all spared nearly. Of course, with the exception of some groups like communists or social democrats. And then the new thing that can be used in this civil society engagement, so it is uh, perhaps going back against moral blindness. So the majority has also to feel responsibility for minorities and not only be morally blind for their plight. For example, Roma have are in, in a number of societies are very much prosecuted also by the state. The state violence is uh, committed against them and society turns a blind eye there. And the last thing is transparency which today has with all YouTube and the new media and so on has can do a lot. For example you certainly do not know the Rodney King case in Los Angeles. It was a very important case. It was a black lorry driver who obviously committed a kind of uh, driving error or something like that. He was pulled out by four policemen uh, out of his lorry and he was terribly beaten up. Uh, he was nearly killed. He, he survived this. And people around it, they at that time they they didn't have these mini cameras. At that time they had real video cameras, so they went out and took videos of that. And then it became a court case, 
and it became a huge case which started a whole reform of the Los Angeles Police Department and a soul searching in the American society why could this happen. So the Rodney King case is one of the first cases where society through these new media, through these possibilities of transparency, of showing things, actually can have an impact. And I can tell you that today the, the Rodney King case is one of the things that is ingrained in American collective memory, in particular of the black community of course. So, and here are national organizations. Didn't I have the other ones first? No, okay. So I found this is your human rights commissioner in Russia. Actually, according to reports and to what I could read, he has done quite some good jobs. He receives, and this speaks of course for who commits state crime, in this country, like everywhere else, the types of state crime that I've talked about are of course mainly committed by criminal justice agencies, by the police, by security forces. They in a state, because the military normally doesn't come out, uh, they are the main uh, groups and he received for example between 2005 and 2008, as I learned from Dr. Bog uh, Bogdan Nova, is that correct? Elena? Yeah, from Elena. As I learned from Elena, that they received 13% of the complaints that this commission received concerned um, criminal justice issues and 14% punishment issues. That means mainly imprisonment and prison uh, execution of sentences. So actually, he took notice of that. And also a number of compliance, as I also learned from Elena and also from another article, mainly came from the military and the treatment of soldiers in the army. So he went there, he went out to offer people the possibility to directly complain. So he traveled the country and he traveled in particular to those parts of the country where he could see most of the complaints came from. Of course you know this situation better than I do and you will have your own judgment on this but at least I wanted to show you that there is an organization in this country that takes up such causes. You have that. Um, so here is the regional court and human rights regime. This is a picture of the European Court of Justice in Luxembourg and of course there is a European Court of Human Rights and so on. And as again I learned from Elena, there are at about 20% of the complaints that are reaching these courts, the European courts, are from Russia. That is, I think, a disproportionate lot actually from these countries. But what you can see is that obviously Russian lawyers, Russian citizens and so on, they see a possibility to go there. Like the Latin Americans, like the Argentinians or the Colombians recently saw the possibility to go to the Inter-American Court of Human Rights to bring cases of uh, forced disappearance and a terrible state crime in Colombia to the court. And the court actually ruled on that and forced Colombia not to, uh, to uh, process these cases in martial courts, under martial law, but in normal courts, normal criminal courts, which means they were out in the open, they were public and not any more secret, which is also very, very important. And here we go back to international tribunals and there are a number of them going on at the moment. Uh, Europe has one last in uh, the one for Yugoslavia, which will close down next year, I think. And there are others. Others are coming up. We have still the one in Cambodia. There is um, and of course the International Criminal Court now uh, who takes up, uh, which takes up such cases. So there are chances, there are mechanisms, there are tools 
This doesn't mean that you can eliminate it, but it means presumably that there can be success stories. And I think that one of the success, there are two success stories at the moment in the world. One success story is Latin America, seemingly with bringing down a high level, as you could see, of state violence. And the other success story is the transitional countries in Europe, which mainly are at least half of them brought their levels of state violence considerably down and let us see whether the others can follow okay thank you very much for uh, your attention thank you and um, especially for ending on this very positive and yeah I'm, a, I'm an optimist <laughs> i'm sorry for that uh so uh i mean I think we have some time for questions. Yes, maybe I will go there in order to see the people. Yeah. yeah. Uh, if anybody has any questions, so I encourage you to uh, ask them. And probably I will even uh, start because I was interested in uh, some of those mechanisms when the leaders of bureaucracy are taken into the court. So, uh, does it happen only after a real conflict, war, or, uh, you know, huge violence when the leaders are not leaders anymore? Or there are other possibilities? Uh, look, there's this old German saying, uh, you only can hang people if you have them. That's of course from the Middle Ages. And one of the problems of international justice is of course that leaders can only be brought to justice when they have stepped down. Uh, what you can see at the moment uh, where it is extremely difficult is with Bashir in Sudan. He has been charged by the international prosecutor with crimes against humanity. However, they don't get him. Yeah? They can put sanctions on that, they can prohibit him from traveling. What does he do? He goes to the meeting of American heads, or African heads of states and says, here I am and this is what uh, the international court can do to me. Um, so, uh, the other problem is, or which is often seen, that a threat of prosecution is stands in the way of a peaceful retreat of the former leader. So for example if a former leader is uh, facing uh, a prosecution they might be much less willing or they might go on and fight until the end. This is an incentive because they don't want to be in the dark. This has been exacerbated. The, the way out of course is amnesties. For example, Pinochet in Chile got an amnesty. He negotiated for stepping down, he negotiated an amnesty. That worked for the first years rather well. However, according to international law, people can be prosecuted for crimes anywhere, for in any signatory state. So a Spanish judge came and because Pinochet had killed uh, Spanish citizens, he each laid charges against Pinochet and asked then when Pinochet was in Britain, asked for his extradition, which caused a huge uproar. In the end, he was not extradited. He went back to Chile, but Chile had to it was only because Chile said they would lay charges uh, against him. He died before that actually happened. Now, I think what is a bit of a problem is that in particular the Inter-American Court has ruled out amnesties. So, it is not only for leaders amnesties, but think of it, could if there is no way of prosecuting, let us say, a person like Bashir. Would you now go for the lesser leaders, for the lower leaders? Don't you have to offer them a kind of amnesty or restoration or 
things like that. So these are very highly politicized. So the problem of international criminal law is that it operates in a highly political sphere. And you don't get leaders. Uh, I'm, I'm not sure how sanction will work uh, internationally. They might work with an African dictator, but think of a very powerful person, a powerful leader. Yes, it, might, yes. it might not work with a very powerful leader. Yeah? Think of China, for example. The Chinese government commits a lot of state violence. Nobody would actually really, really go for them. Yeah? But you have other mechanisms. I think I mentioned that yesterday. There are changes in the way perhaps this is why it is not only the deterrence threat or bringing people to justice, but the fact that there is a court and there is a law makes a difference. So for example, this is called the expressive function of law. And since you are sociologists, you might need old Durkheim. And Durkheim said the law is also expresses morality. It expresses values. So it has this kind of expressive value. And there is a large group of international lawyers or political scientists who say it's hard to find out a deterrent effect because we have so many difficulties to bring them to justice. But what about this kind of expressive function of law? And I think this expressive function of law that it tells something, it tells a story, it tells people changes in what is right and wrong, we can take that also to the domestic level. It is important that courts tell a story of the values and judgments tell a story about these values, even if they would not deter state violence in the first instance. But that, for example, through some cases, they make a case and they clearly state this is not acceptable. Like Nuremberg, for example, stated this is not acceptable anymore. This we cannot do. It happened immediately afterwards. I mean, unfortunately, it happened uh, not immediately, when did the, f yeah, Indonesia was the first one in, with 100,000 in, uh, in the 1960s. We have uh, um, the Cultural Revolution in the 1970s in China with presumably 10 million uh, victims. We have Cambodia with 2 million, which is nearly one third of the population. So it doesn't mean that it doesn't happen, but it, it makes clear it should not happen. I think that's important. Uh, I don't know actually how to formulate my question, but um, whole, whole your conception um, is based on the model when state is uh, the subject and law is the main instrument or also the subject. But how uh, uh, the opposite situations can be, con can be considered? Uh, different revolutions and what we could observe, for example, uh, in Libya with Gaddafi. Mm -hmm. So when uh, citizens, when the society, different social groups, uh, uh, mm, they executed this um, uh, pressure, this uh, mm, violence. violence, yes, this violence. Uh, and also, uh, I have an example from the Soviet times, from the Soviet period, when uh, not the neither the state nor uh, official law uh, were the instruments of this violation. But for example, comrade, law, comrade courts, Tavarishitsky and Sudi, that were the groups of the Soviet citizens which uh, could evaluate their uh, behavior of s some other Soviet citizens from the points of morality. Mm -hmm. So uh, I would like just to ask how can you um, how can you explain and maybe just give some comments on this the situations like this when, when this model get opposite from the viewpoint of the state. 
So let us first start with Lubia, perhaps with the example of Lubia. Uh, I think this is an example of, at that time, which you mentioned, a state that derails, so that becomes increasingly weak and in its weakness lashes out to others. But of course, if I say state violence, um, I think I should introduce another term. So of course the crimes against humanity and what is called also mass atrocities, that is also committed of course by the uprising groups or by today by militias. Yeah, which are in a way like in Sudan where uh, brought in by the government or actually uh, paid by the government. We also have that in Latin America that militias are paid by the government. I think it was also in the conflicts in Russia that there were militias that were uh, paid and ordered a function as an arm of the government but in a way we're also independent yeah so the question is how much state crime is that we can say because the state was seminal in setting these up financing them or for example in Yugoslavia it was uh, presumably and that was one of the charges against Milosevic that he set up and financed and armed the militias who in the end the Serbian militias who committed the genocide for example in Srebrenica that was why he was charged with the genocide so he was responsible in that way but much of these crimes in particular in such a situation are committed by other groups, by groups that are by no ways the state. And uh, perhaps you have heard of this, the Security Council in the end of March decided to send troops to Eastern Congo where a kind of warlord who is uh, using the mines to extract minerals and so on, but also who is responsible for mass rapes and killing of, sit of civilians in the region is absolutely terrible. And the Security Council sent or sent troops or sending troops to help the weak Congo government to actually to, to get rid of this group. So this is one thing. The other thing is you mentioned these uh, kind of citizen committees and this is a very interesting thing in the rule of law in what I would now say authoritarian states. Because authoritarian, authoritarian states are working with a lot of out of court informal mechanisms yeah there is a wonderful book about that how that worked in the former uh, in former East Germany in the former GDR by Inga Markowitz who looked at the files of a lower court from 1947 I think to 1989 so throughout the whole period and what you can see there is not only in in communist countries but also in other countries how authoritarian states set up particular mechanisms particular committees out of the court system out of beside the rule of law and so these courts or these committees then are used to um, solve conflicts. There is also a book uh, on conflicts in Romania under uh, Ceausescu. Uh, she calls that party mood courts. So when party courts are established to solve an uprising of workers in a factory and there were obviously grievances so what happened then is not it was and there was a terrible uh, st uh, state violence going on and or in curbing this uh, uprising and what happened was there was a party commission set up that cared for that and then another commission and it was by this way it was channeled away from the rule of law by all these other commissions citizens commissions who look into neighborhoods who regulate and so on and you can't do anything against that uh, 
and I think this is for me this is really part of not making where actually you have another paradox so these kind of associations do not make citizens powerful but they make them weak because I mean if your neighbors are going against you and accusing you of X and Y and Z then it becomes really I mean you get really restricted and what is so interesting about Inga Markovic's story about the development in the former GDR is that they um, the people didn't like it anymore the people wanted the real court so for example uh, in divorce cases which where they started out with having workers commissions you know who discussed it then and neighborhood commissions and citizen commissions the people refused to come from the 1970s 1980s onwards they didn't come anymore they didn't want to discuss divorce cases with their colleagues yeah rightly so we think this is not nice this is not good did, so, did they want before? sorry this is a big question but in the end they refused to do it they just you know they voted with their feet when the meeting was set up they didn't come well, and then you can hardly do any kind of reconciliation with your co-workers so and what I find so interesting about Inga Markovic's story is and also the court started to use much more let us say procedural fairness and rule of law principles uh, rather than issuing let us say class justice which they did in the first year and Inga Markovic has a number of cases for that so they started to use principles principles of justice principles of fairness and so on and so forth more and more so so they they evolved a kind of under this cover a rule of law system but I think the main the main thing or the biggest problem is actually all these kind of institutions that take justice out of courts out of its regular procedural way and you know that in each constitution or it is a human right actually established in the covenant of the 1960s which was to which Russia has signed up as most countries have that each that um, a person has a right to its judge by law so there needs to be a court system where you can go with a certain complaint and I think that relates to your research if you have huge complaint systems media here and there and there which takes off things out of the normal court system this is a huge danger because it is absolutely out of the rule of law out of the courts
the Committee Against Torture, according to the new optional protocol, has the right to visit such clinics, which is a very important point, because they are treating very vulnerable people. There was recently a scandal uh, in the UK about such a clinic where people were abused, terribly abused. Uh, it depends very much on the system. Um, these clinics or psychiatric hospitals are not part of the state system in that way, but the state is involved in, the court system is involved in a number of ways. So somebody can be confined or can be brought to a psychiatric hospital only or kept there against their will only with certain kind of court orders so they have to be have to set up guardians it has to be reviewed by judges and by special family it's mainly i think in the family courts in germany there is one part of the psych of psychiatric hospitals where people who are very dangerous who have uh, had an uh, as, um, who have committed terrible violent crimes and where there is a risk that they would commit these crimes again where they are than in detention. These are very few, they are part of it and again this is only possible with the court system and there has recently been uh, for example Germany has been to, um, there has been a review of the German practices and the court I think of human rights or the court of justice has declared them as non-legal and non-constitutional and they have to change these practices so a lot of things are going on and certainly psychiatric hospitals are a place where a lot of violence is committed. It is not in this way state violence if it is not committed by agents of the state but they are of course liable and the people who are running these hospitals are also liable yeah, for that are also accountable for the well-being of the people who are there. So but this in a, in a rule of, or let us say, this is under um, everything that takes away the freedom of a person has to be under judicial review. Yeah, we just, I think, remember all those cases in the USSR when yeah. the dissidents, the political dissidents, yeah. were taken into psychiatric clinics and treated there. Yeah. And of course, some of them, you know, could not function anymore afterwards, or were, um, <coughs> you know, filled with different people and things yeah. like that. And uh, we have a new initiative that is said in some media to be uh, something more or less the same to uh -huh. in today's Russia, yeah, that you mm -hmm. can be taken into the psychiatric clinic just because you have. Um, some suspicious thing like you behave not really like a normal person mm. and so it means that then you could be treated whatever nobody knows yeah, what, what will become to you so um, there is this fear of the new uh, legal initiatives of our government that are usually surrounded by these fears but we hope that this is just a normal law that is actually bringing justice. Mm. I mean I, I think you are absolutely right that it is very important to look into these institutions and because also of the history but uh, Western European states don't have very good history in their psychiatric hospitals neither so there has been and if you think of Germany that in, under Nazi Germany they are killed at about half a million of mentally disabled people that was part of the genocide so uh, but I think it is so important to look into that and uh, to have also international organizations or to who like with this optional protocol they can go to psychiatric wards thank you very much